are you? Here for the double bill today? Oh. Crap. There's another great hearing this afternoon. We roll out hearings all the time. We roll out hearings all the time. Yeah, that's true. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled U.S. Aid to Pakistan, Part 2, Planning and Accountability, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, it's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, without objection, so ordered. Good morning. I want to thank you both for coming here today. Uh, we're going to continue our ongoing oversight of the planning, accountability, and effectiveness of U.S. aid to Pakistan. On October 15, 2009, President Obama signed the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act. It's informally known as the Kerry Luga Berman Bill, tripling U.S. civilian economic and development assistance to Pakistan to $1.5 billion annually until 2014. While Kerry Luga Berman was a largely bipartisan demonstration, of the United States' commitment to a long-term assistance to Pakistan, serious concerns remain regarding the ability of USAID and the State Department to effectively and efficiently manage and account for such a massive increase in assistance. In November 2009, I led a congressional delegation to Pakistan in order to investigate, among other things, the status of the U.S. assistance programs in the State Department's and the USAID's capacity to manage and oversee Kerry Luga Berman funding. After four trips, it is apparent that the security environment in Pakistan has grown markedly worse in recent years. During the congressional delegation, we met with Pakistan's civilian leadership, its political opposition, and a wide variety of civil society members, NGOs, and international contractors. We also traveled to Peshawar to deliver aid supplies directly to the principal hospital that had been receiving wounded from the many bombings during the past year. Following that trip, in December 2009, the administration announced its new regional stabilization, stabilization strategy for Afghanistan and Pakistan. That plan will, I quote, increase direct assistance through Pakistani institutions, close quote. 
namely the ministries and local NGOs, and focus more money on high-impact projects such as major, major energy and water infrastructure. The plan also promises to reduce USAID's over-reliance on large international contractors as implementing partners. I want to state at the outset that I'm supportive of exploring a new aid approach and appreciative of the time and energy that our witnesses and the administration have put into crafting the administration's new strategy. That said, given the importance of U.S. national security interests in Pakistan and the magnitude of the United States taxpayer dollars authorized for development and economic assistance there, it is critically important that we carefully scrutinize plans for implementation of the new strategy and particularly its accountability mechanisms. In short, we must make certain that the administration's new strategy will not send more money through weaker systems, systems that lack the internal controls developed with time and experience. This presents several challenges. First, how will the State Department and USAID gain visibility into the operations of ministries that have historically resisted robust oversight? In light of Pakistan's sensitivities regarding impingements on its sovereignty, this challenge will be particularly acute. Second, I'm concerned about USAID's internal capacity to oversee and account for funds directed through Pakistan's ministries and local NGOs. For years, USAID has been marginalized and stripped of personnel, while at the same time, United States foreign policy has increasingly emphasized aid delivery in high-risk conflict and post-conflict countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. This challenge is only made more difficult by the current security environment that makes it very difficult for either USAID personnel or Western expats for, to see, let alone actively manage or oversee, many projects, particularly those in the federally administered tribal areas of Fatah and the Northwest Frontier Province. I plan to continue to work with Congress and the administration to bolster USAID's internal staffing and cap capability. We must reverse USAID's decline in the last decade if it is to serve as a central tool of U.S. foreign policy in South Asia and the Middle East, a task that has been assigned but not given the tools to fulfill. I also want to highlight the recent challenges that the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad has had in obtaining visas from Pakistan for critical U.S. government personnel from state, USAID, and the Department of Defense. Many of the visa applications have been denied or delayed, including visas for auditors, accountants, and inspectors the very people that both the agencies and the Congress rely on to make sure that civilian assistance is spent as it is intended. From the position as Chairman of the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee, I want to make clear to the Government of Pakistan that the United States civilian assistance comes as a package, funding, programming, and oversight. Pakistan cannot accept the funding but deny United States agency the personnel or the access for critical con uh, oversight. I ask both witnesses here today to keep the subcommittee informed regarding developments with the visa applications for their agency's respective personnel and to only fund programs and projects for which they have the personnel in place to perform the proper oversight. The third issue of concern to me is to ensure that U.S. funds directed to Pakistan's ministries are supplementing Pakistan's funding of those ministries, not simply displacing it. At the end of the day, the government of Pakistan must own and take responsibility for each of the projects we embark on together. Instilling a sense of such ownership will be a critical and delicate challenge going forward. I'm a strong believer that the United States civilian assistance to Pakistan is critical to the stabilization and the health of Pakistan and to long-term United States national security interests. The Kerry Luga Berman is a major down payment on our shared future. In the best circumstances, however, it is an extraordinary endeavor to create, manage, and oversee billions of dollars in development assistance programs, and Pakistan is not in the best of circumstances. That's why the subcommittee has made a great effort to exercise proactive oversight in order to ensure that critically, critical accountability mechanisms are in place from day one. With that said, I'd like to uh, defer to my colleague, Mr. Flake, for his opening remarks. I thank, <clears throat> thank the chairman. Thank him for holding this hearing and also undertaking the CODEL a while ago. I wish I could have gone. It uh, would have been helpful, and uh, I look forward to the testimony today. Uh, it it uh, was interesting when this aid package was announced, certainly in Pakistan. Uh, I don't think any, any aid package has been met with such uh, <laughs> a derision and, uh, from the recipients. And uh, it, it certainly piqued our interest here to see how it was played there. Uh, obviously, we know it was for domestic uh, politics. But uh, I think it's safe to say that, that it, it's difficult to see um, or to assume that any country could receive this amount of aid and be able to transition that quickly, and as well as our aid agencies, uh, to, to ramp up this substantially in this short period of time 
as the chairman said, in the best of circumstances, and these are not the best. So I look forward to the testimony and, uh, and uh, for all you have to say. Thank you. Just a quick aside to that. We, after the uh, Kerry Luga Bourbon bill passed, and uh, we had had, this committee had quite a bit to do with that, as, as Jeff knows. And so we had an occasion to speak both in Pakistan and back here at home. But what's indicative, I think, is one occasion up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I spoke before a few hundred the Pakistanis, and when I got through, one half of the room was mad that we had put the sanctions on, not the sanctions, but the conditions, and the other half of the room was mad because they weren't strong enough, yeah. and they were all Pakistanis, so it depends on how you break down on that. So, With that, we'd love to hear from our witnesses. Uh, we have five-minute remarks, as you know. Uh, we swear our witnesses in on this committee, so I ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record please reflect that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction of our witnesses, if I can find them. Here we are. Mr. Daniel Feldman serves as a deputy to the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the United States Department of State. He previously served as Director of Multilateral and Humanitarian Affairs for the National Security Council, where he was responsible for global human rights issues. A former congressional staff member, Mr. Feldman has also served as counsel and communications advisor to the Senate Homeland Security and the Government Affairs Committee. Mr. Feldman holds a BA from Tufts University in Massachusetts and from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School and a JD from Columbia University Law School. Mr. James Beaver he currently serves as director of the Afghanistan-Pakistan Task Force at the United States Agency for in uh, International Development, where he oversees more than $4 billion in U.S. assistance to Afghanistan and Pakistan. A member of the Senior Foreign Service, Mr. Beaver previously served as Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Middle East, providing leadership for $2.5 billion in U.S. assistance to the Middle East and North Africa. Mr. Beaver holds a BA from Cornell University and an MS from Georgetown University. Again, thank you both uh, for making yourselves available today and for sharing your considerable expertise. Uh, you both are experienced witnesses before Congress, so I, I know you know the drill, five minutes if you can. Keep it reasonably close to that. We have all read or will read your remarks, and then we'd like to get to the question and answer period if we could. Mr. Feldman, let's start with you, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Tierney and Ranking Member Flank, uh, Flake, for uh, the uh, opportunity to be here and to uh, discuss our efforts to enhance planning and accountability of U.S. development assistance to Pakistan. Um, I will give a more pared down and focused uh, version of the of the written uh, testimony, just so we have a, a kind of a baseline uh, for for our conversation afterwards. And then I'll also welcome the opportunity to speak uh, afterwards once we start Q and A. I'm happy to address the visa uh, situation or some of the other uh, specific issues you you raised in your opening statement. Um, as you know, Pakistan faces threats of many forms. Uh, the security situation weighs heavily on all Pakistanis. Too many of the country's citizens do not have access to functioning health or education systems. Pakistan's energy crisis leaves businesses and homes in the dark many hours of the day, and the looming water crisis poses an existential threat to Pakistan and its neighbors. All these factors increase the stakes on the effectiveness of our assistance programs. Your committee rightly identifies the crucial role of proper planning and oversight in the success of our efforts. Since 2002, when the U.S. re-engaged with Pakistan, a large percentage of our civilian assistance has been tied up in large contracts and grants with U.S. organizations that have produced uneven results, have lacked flexibility, have not provided optimum value, and have not built sufficient Pakistani capacity. Much of our past programming did not address the issues most important to Pakistanis, such as energy and water. Pakistanis believed that a high percentage of U.S. resources did not reach them, given our work and our people had been mostly invisible to the average citizens of the country. And the average Pakistani has perceived our assistance as being str too strongly tied to their country's military and intelligence cooperation with the U.S., rather than being aimed toward the long-term well-being of the country's citizens. Um, all this pointed to a very large and expensive missed opportunity, which we have tried to rectify uh, over the course of the past 14 months. Um, USG assistance in Pakistan now aims to expand our relationship beyond predominantly security issues, providing instead a more balanced approach that will help the Pakistani people overcome the political, social, and economic challenges that threaten the country's stability. As you referenced in the regional stability um, uh, the stabilization strategy that, that, we, uh, that we circulated earlier to, to the Hill, we hope to address, uh, first of all, the immediate energy, water, and related economic crises. Second, support broader economic and political reforms that are ne necessary for political growth, for sustainable growth. Three, improve health care and education. Four, help Pakistan respond to the humanitarian challenges caused by extremist violence and natural disasters. And five, combat extremism. 
we have a remarkable opportunity uh, before us uh, to deliver this more effective and balanced uh, environment for delivering civilian assistance. Um, this is formed in large part, as you noted, by the passage of the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act, Act the Kerry Luger Berman legislation, as well as the initiatives that have been undertaken uh, thus far by President Obama, Secretary Clinton, Ambassador Holbrook, and others in the executive branch. Um, how we are responding to these opportunities is through um, several broad uh, categories of, of uh, a reformulated uh, vision towards assistance. First of all is the emphasis on smaller and more flexible contracts. To provide more flexibility and improve monitoring and oversight, we are shifting away from large U.S.-based contracts to smaller, predominantly Pakistani ones, with fewer subgrants and subcontracts. These will be managed by our increased number of staff in the field. Second is decentralization. Within the next few months, USAID teams will be placed in Lahore and Karachi, in addition to the current offices in Islamabad and Peshawar. A decentralized programming platform will enable more location-appropriate development activities at the provincial and district level, make it easier for U.S. officials in the field to oversee and monitor programs and prevent fraud, and allow more regular engagement between our personnel and the populations we aim to benefit. Third is the meaningful assistance. Relevant and effective assistance must materially address the issues that count most to the average Pakistani. The overwhelming message conveyed to the Secretary Ambassador Holbrook during their visits to Pakistan was the need for assistance with the country's chronic power and water shortages. In response, we have begun projects to reduce the hours of power blackouts, make more potable water available to poor communities, and improve the availability and management of irrigation water for farms. As these projects move quickly from feasibility to implementation, we will begin the same process for projects that address other pro priority Pakistani needs, including medical and educational facilities. Fourth is the increased assistance, as you mentioned, uh, provided through and to Pakistani institutions. In order to maximize the amount of our resources that will remain in Pakistan, we are transitioning our assistance modalities. We will do so by decreasing our reliance on large international contractors and an aim instead to build institutional capacity and sustainability by increasing direct assistance through Pakistani implementing partners. While these arrangements involve transfers to Pakistani institutions, this is not blank check. Uh, budget su support. Instead, they are the results of negotiations with USAID regarding how the funds will be spent, how progress will be monitored, and how the financial arrangements will be implemented. In the case of budget support transfers, they will be for targeted institutions and uses rather than general budget support as was previously provided in the past. And all this goes to the issue of improved accountability and oversight. Our stated policy goal of working more through Pakistani institutions does have the potential to contribute to corruption, as we recognize. To mitigate this risk, we are increasing the number of direct hire contracting staff and inspector general personnel that will reside in Pakistan. We are also expanding the use of Pakistani public accounting firms to conduct financial audits of funds provided to Pakistani NGOs, train Pakistani public accounting firms and Pakistan's Auditor General on how to conduct audits to U.S. standards, help the Pakistan Auditor General conduct financial audits of funds provided to Pakistan government entities and build the capacity of the Pakistan government to carry out or assist with investigations and coordinate audits and investigations among the U.S. Inspectors General and the government and the GAO. In the past two months, over $26 million in contracts to buttress audit and monitoring capabilities in Pakistan have been awarded using ESF. The Secretary, Ambassador Holbrook, our entire team at the Special Representative's Office uh, who work on Pakistan believe we have a duty to ensure that USG resources are used for the purposes intended by Congress, and the reforms I have outlined will, over time, decrease costs for assistance programs, increase the amount of U.S. assistance directly benefiting the Pakistani people and Pakistani institutions, and ensure much better development effects. I am happy to talk about any of the details. Thank you, Mr. Felder. Mr. Beaver. Thank you very much, Chairman Tierney. Ranking Member Flake, other distinguished members of the committee, and thanks for your invitation to USAID to speak with you this morning. Chairman, I particularly appreciate your longstanding support for rebuilding America's Foreign Assistance Agency, especially the staffing. Thank you, sir. Um, when USAID reopened its mission in Pakistan in 2002, I had just come back from serving four years in India as the Deputy Mission Director. I was then serving as the Director for South Asian Affairs and, of course, Pakistan and uh, had become in Afghanistan our biggest uh, responsibilities at that time. As you know, we started out with a very large cash transfer at that point uh, to the government of Pakistan and then gradually grew that into primary health care and education uh, attention in coordination with other donors. Following the, uh, the, uh, President Obama's strategy review, we now have a focus on forging new partnerships with Pakistan and with Pakistani entities, as well as rebuilding the capacity of Pakistan public institutions, as well as its private institutions, and affecting lives of individual Pakistanis. 
I'm going to talk just briefly about the civilian assistance strategy, about local implementation through Pakistani institutions, some of the safeguard mechanisms, FATA development, and a little bit on democracy governance. Uh, as you know, under the Enhanced Partnership with Pakistan Act, which authorizes a tripling of U.S. civilian assistance, bringing our funding up to uh, $1.5 billion annually as a target. Uh, our three fo foci, if you will, uh, for our assistance is on infrastructure and constraints to infrastructure uh, for development in Pakistan. Second is on building the capacity of the government of Pakistan to deliver key and appreciated services to its people and to improve the connectivity between the people, uh, the governed, and the governing. And finally, to improve the uh, capacity of the Pakistan institutions to be able to implement on their own. In terms of uh, our presence in the country, as you know, uh, at, at the time actually that I served in Pakistan, which was as a division chief for energy assistance uh, about uh, 25, 26 years ago in the war against the Soviets next door, uh, we had uh, um, many, many American AID officers in Islamabad and elsewhere around the country. And as a matter of fact, uh, we were the second largest staffed uh, operation in the world next to Egypt at that time. Today, although of course we had a large hiatus in the 90s, uh, we have about uh, 30, 35 uh, U.S. Foreign Service officers at our aid operation plus another couple dozen um, uh, what we call U.S. Uh, personal service contractors and uh, uh, over 100 Foreign Service nationals. But this is much smaller than we had back in the, the years during the 1980s. But thanks to the Enhanced Partnership Act, uh, we do plan to increase these levels in consultation with the uh, embassy uh, colleagues and Ambassador Patterson and our colleagues here in Washington. We will be increasing our American staff significantly as well as our Pakistani staff, which is extremely important. Our Pakistani staff who are world class are our eyes, our ears, and our brains, and our continuity from one American uh, rotation, if you will, to another. So we'll be building up our project management capability, our financial oversight capability, and our procurement capability, and our legal capability, and I can go into more of that if you would like. Um, we will also be focusing more on the provinces, not just the federal government in Islamabad, which is extremely important, but also the legitimate provincial government authorities who, for example, have responsibility for education in the country of Pakistan. And, um, in terms of local implementation, we will be moving to find ways, and we're already aggressively pursuing this, to diversify our mechanisms and our partners. And I think this is sound U.S. foreign policy. I think it's sound U.S. foreign assistance technique. It's not to the exclusion of our existing partners. There will be a role for them, too, but we are trying to broaden and diversify the players who can deliver uh, the American assistance program and also strengthen their capabilities, whether it's in the government, private sector, or uh, civil society in, in Pakistan. Um, in terms of oversight and monitoring, my colleague uh, Dan Feldman has already addressed those. I can go into some of those more in more detail later. I just want to stress that we believe in AID that the IG and the GAO are our best friends. They're like our family physician um, that, that travel with us. And we may not always like the techniques they use to identify what's needed in, uh, in our health, but it's good to know what the diagnostics are so we can deal with them. And we, we uh, coordinate closely with them accordingly. In FATA, I will just say that uh, we're very proud, despite very dangerous uh, situations in the FATA and the federal administered tribal areas, we have been able to implement over $140 million of social and economic support projects, mostly at the community level in all seven of the FATA agencies and in all six of the frontier regions. I have to stress, uh, Mr. Chairman and other members, uh, in my own view, having spent nine years living in South Asia and in other dangerous parts of the world additional years, this is the bravest, uh, most courageous, riskiest, uh, but most overdue action that I can think of in the U.S. Foreign Assistance Program. Um, in democracy governance, one thing I would like to just state uh, specifically is that we will continue to support the government of Pakistan in its development of its own parliament, 
and we are providing assistance to the government of Pakistan to construct a capability so that there are staff support for the members of its modular shore of its parliament uh, and to help them with rule of law, however complicated and challenging that is, because it is those values that connect most deeply among the Pakistani people when you think of democracy and governance. In closing, I just want to say thank you again for inviting us, and I want to just dedicate uh, our testimony today to those very brave American, third country national, and Pakistani staff at our embassy, including our AID mission, who risk their lives every day to carry out U.S. foreign policy and to make uh, Pakistan uh, a better, more representative government. Thank you, sir. Well, I want to thank both of you witnesses. And Mr. Beaver, I appreciate your latter remarks. I'm sure Mr. Flake and the other members here do as well. Uh, we, have, we don't mention often enough uh, the serious sacrifices being made by those families and the important role they play, even though we do have Admiral Mullen and uh, most of our generals over there talking about the fact that this cannot be won solely militarily uh, and that we have to have uh, people willing to do those jobs. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Let me start. We're going to start the five-minute uh, rounds of questioning on that. I'd like to start just by reading to you both a, uh, a, a quote from a, uh, an economic officer at USAID who, who filed this dissenting cable on October 2, 2009. In it, it says, the USAID mission in Pakistan is receiving contradictory objectives from Ambassador Holbrook. On the one hand, it is expected to achieve high-impact counterinsurgency and broad-based economic development objectives as quickly as possible, especially in those areas more susceptible to radical Taliban recruitment. On the other hand, it is asked to do this by working through national and local government channels and host country contractors and NGOs, and not through U.S. contractors and NGOs, to avoid the overhead charges of the latter and to improve the institutional capacity and legitimacy of government agencies and local institutions. These are all worthy goals, and USAID can achieve them all. However, they are contradictory objectives without a reasonable transition period for the latter. Can you give me your reaction to, uh, to that statement and, and what we're doing to address those concerns? Um, Chairman Tierney, that's, uh, we certainly value the, the dissent channel quite a bit. This was uh, an issue that came up at the very outset of our move to push towards more uh, local Pakistani implementers. We've had a variety of meetings um, in post and briefings with, uh, with staff and members about this. I think that that was a, a, a concern at the very outset of this process. I, we have not It was a concern while we were there at about that time. That yeah. It was, so so last, uh, this, this, the announcement initially was at the end of the fiscal year, and so right around September 30th, October 1st at the time, this cable um, was uh, was written. There was a lot of uh, anxiety, I think, because of a lack of communication about exactly what would be done, what how quickly we were going to start this initiative. Um, I think that we have certainly worked our way through all uh, virtually all of those concerns at this point. Primarily, we started a review of every uh, major contract through, and, and I think there were a lot of um, uh, existing contractors, uh, including NGOs and others, who were quite concerned that uh, you know the contract may end in, in 90 days or something like that. They we wouldn't be able to do it. We have thus far only terminated one contract in the last four or five months since this review has happened. It was only a two and a half million dollar contract. Everything else has continued through uh, through the next year. And and nobody's so been asked to wind down, or, or, or none of them are winding down. We and we said that when, if they were going to wind down, we would give them a 45-day notice. None of that has happened, and none of that we don't have the intent for anything like that to happen. What we have done is, I think, put the international contracting uh, community on notice that for new contracts, and as we start expend, um, expending and dispersing uh, most of this new Kerry Luger Berman money and, and others, we are looking to first instance uh, to Pakistani implementers and NGOs to build the capacity, as, as I discussed. Um, we have always said that we you know, will reserve the right that if there is not the ability or capacity there, that we will continue using uh, international contractors. Um, we we work actively with uh, the international NGO community as well as the local Pakistani NGOs. In fact, we have uh, on Investor Holbrook staff someone dedicated just to NGO relationships and working with NGOs on these issues. So we're in no way trying to terminate that, but we are trying, uh, as, as I outlined in the opening statement, to really build local capacity uh, and to do that as uh, quickly and effectively as possible. So I, I think that we are well beyond those problems, okay. but I defer to, to, to Jim to Thank see what you. his sense is. Thanks. Uh, can both of you gentlemen assure the subcommittee that you'll keep it informed regarding the visa issue, uh, developments that, on that, and regarding your agency's personnel, and give us some assurance that you'll only fund those programs and projects for which 
uh, personnel are in place to perform the, the adequate oversight? It, on the issue of visas, um, it was – there has been a backlog, but uh, – and, and, and it was very problematic, but uh, we have made very substantial progress over the last few months on, on the visa issue, working very closely with the, the government of Pakistan. Um, Ambassador Haqqani is, is in our office uh, very frequently giving us updates on that issue. I think there was a backlog of about 500 visas in January. It's down to, uh, I believe, less than 200 at, at, at this point. So we are actively uh, moving through those, and uh, we've made it very clear that this is in the best interests, uh, not only of us, but of the Pakistanis, since many of these are auditors, uh, in order to be able to go through the well, exactly that point. And, and, and we need some assurances that we're not going to start spending this money without those auditors and other people in place to, to monitor it. Mr. Yeah. Be Beaver? Yeah. Uh, if I could just comment, I, I share uh, Dan's concerns about this. Um, of particular concern to us are when we have visa problems for inspectors general from Manila or of our security people that we need uh, from our Washington security office who we need to get out to post to consult with our own internal security people to improve to make sure that the lives of our employees be they Pakistani or American uh, are, uh, are safeguarded as much as possible without the ability to have an independent inspector general function out there at post uh, or without the ability to keep our people as safe as is reasonable in the given the risks we will not be able to function as productively and we would have to change the way we do our business or even think through uh, uh, what business we do. Right. Well, that's, so can I take that as a yes, that we will not be spending this money where there is not uh, the adequate personnel for auditing and oversight in place? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Where is the, 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 the Feldman says yes, Mr. Beaver, you say yes <laughs> as well? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Flake. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, when we're talking about uh, um, building capacity with the institutions there, uh, you mentioned that you're trying to hire uh, firms, Pakistani CPA firms and others, to audit a lot of this. How is that going so far? How much capacity needs to be built there uh, before you can transition a lot of the work uh, from international contractors? Mr. Feldman? Yeah, uh, maybe I could start. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Congressman. Um, well, <clears throat> Uh, AID has a long history of doing pre-award audits, for example, and of seeking to build local capacity, including through our inspector general operations. They often will reach out to local CPA firms affiliated with international CPA firms, and Americans in particular. So in many of the countries we work, including in Pakistan, there is some, some, uh, some uh, depth there for us to work with. We've uh, uh, now have uh, in place a number of CPA, local Pakistani CPA firms, and we have asked our IG to uh, give us the, I would say, the good housekeeping seal of approval on those local Pakistani firms so that we know that when we use them, they're ones that our own IG, Inspector General Operation, are comfortable with. So we would often go to those that have also worked, for example, uh, to do the audit, financial audit work for the World Bank, or for the, for the British or for the Asian Development Bank. So we try a number of different ways to go about this to make sure we get good, high-quality uh, operations to do that internal audit. And I would just add, um, although I defer to, to Jim on the specific numbers, but um, we've been actively seeking to, to um, increase those number of pre-vetted Pakistani CPA firms. I think it has gone from five or six in, uh, at the end of last year to close to 20 at, at this point. Um, I've seen between 16 and 20. I know we're in the process of, of, of vetting quite a number of them. And then in terms of the actual pre-award surveys, I believe over – um, 100 Pakistani organizations have been identified for pre-award surveys and about uh, uh, roughly um, uh, 40 are, are completed or underway. And so the process of, of vetting on the financial and accounting side is, is uh, very much underway at a very robust uh, level. We uh, mentioned the, uh, the reaction to the conditions that was placed uh, on the money by the uh, Pakistani government. Um, have they reconciled uh, with with that? Are they are they okay? Um, and is their displeasure manifested in other areas uh, or areas other than visas? Um, and just tell me how that process is going. I think that um, I was very actively involved in in uh, the aftermath of the Kerry Lugar Berman uh, legislation, and I worked with. Um, 
Chairman Berman, uh, Chairman Kerry, and, and Foreign Minister Qureshi when he was here um, to try to work through some of these issues, including the ultimate production by the Congress of the Joint Explanatory Statement on Kerry Luger Berman. Um, it was a backlash which we perhaps should have anticipated, but but we but we didn't. Um, it had been so long in the making, um, and there had been so much news about it that we, that we didn't expect this. I think it's fair to say that a large part of this was ginned up for domestic political purposes. Um, that um, once we were able to get the explanatory statement out, and once people were actually able to focus on what is actually in it. I mean, I think so there was so much misinformation about this, then pinging on the sovereignty of the Pakistan Pakistani government on on what exactly how onerous the conditions might be what sorts of reporting there may be um, once we were able to get through that initial few weeks and actually get people um, to read what the, the legislation actually did and what it would require and what the opportunities were um, we've uh, it's been a much more uh, cooperative uh, facilitative environment um, uh, I think uh, having Senator Kerry there to explain it was was very very helpful and in, in, including uh, with uh, with the Parliament um, the secretary's uh, trip I think really was a kind of turning point and at one point she said uh, quite bluntly in a, in a town hall look if you don't want it don't take it uh, and uh, and I think since that point we've um, we've really uh, kind of turned the corner and we have not seen any sort of kind of negative press uh, like this over the last few months if I may just add um, there is one important evolution now over uh, about eight years ago eight years ago when we did the first big cash transfers 600 million dollars um, it was very difficult to get the Pakistan government to cooperate with us in certain ways we needed in order to have rights of audit in the right places we had to have them. But we now have an agreement with the Supreme Audit Institute of the Government of Pakistan that will allow us, in fact, to audit and to have our auditors and our CPA firms and the Pakistan CPA firms enter in to audit wherever we feel we need to have it. That's an important step forward. And we've learned some lessons, and so has the Government of Pakistan in this regard. Uh, very quickly, Mr. Beaver, the security situation in the FATA for our contractors and uh, Grantees, is it improving generally, or does it uh, uh, does it go up and down depending on uh, government action in the area? Uh, I would say the latter. It 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 goes up and down. It is, of course, a uh, a, a risky place and a sometimes dangerous place. Um, uh, that has not stopped us from being able to help the FATA Secretariat uh, and the FATA Development Authority from being able to do what they need to do with our help. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, it requires a great deal of sensitivity, and particularly in Waziristan, of course, because of the fighting that has made it especially uh, complicated. Um, we're very mindful of the risks uh, at play there, including for the Pakistanis that work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quigley, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I join you and other members in um, thanking your efforts in Pakistan, we recognize how difficult they are. But um, to get past the specific points today, um, how do we overcome what seems to be overwhelming distrust by the Pakistani people toward our government and our aid? Uh, my numbers may be old, <coughs> but uh, they're from last year that 64 percent of the public see the U.S. as an enemy. And 9% of them see this as a, a partner. Um, obviously, this comes from many, many reasons. You would know better than, than myself, but obviously the drone attacks contribute to this significantly. And whether or not you can argue that those are a, a good idea, uh, they seem to be having a very negative impact on how people react to us. And if at, le if at least in large part this is... Uh, these efforts are to win the hearts and minds of the Pakistani people. Gentlemen, doesn't it seem like they just blow away all your efforts? And no matter what you do and how much money we spend and how efficient we spend it, the drone attacks seem to be you know, literally destroying our efforts to win the hearts and minds. Congressman, I can't comment on the on the drone attacks, but I, I would say that um, the effort to rebuild our um, our reputation and the relationship with the Pakistani people is um, 
is is the f chief underlying um, uh, framework of of how we are proceeding with our uh, uh, with our relationship there, um, and it goes back again to the question I think that um, that Congressman Flake asked on on Kerry Luger Berman. Uh, there is a great degree of skepticism um, in Pakistan about America. Do, but do you think these numbers are in the ballpark? I think they I think they are in the ballpark. Yes, uh, I think that. Um, we are working on on moving them up. I think we have seen some increases when Secretary Clinton was there. They um, th they certainly rose. I'm not sure where they currently stand right now, but yes, there are, th we are uh, the the um, the perception of Americans is is not a positive one, and it's formed by uh, a history where they have seen our interest uh, wax and wane. Um, based primarily on our security and military interest. Um, they see it as a, a very self-interested relationship. They don't believe that we are interested in, in a longer-term relationship, and that's why so much of our work has been to emphasize that this is a long-term relationship, that it is uh, based on, uh, on a, a, civ a civilian uh, relationship as well as a security one, um, that uh, it's a people-to-people -people relationship. This was uh, the entire theme of the Secretary's trip last fall, where she talked about turning the page uh, and building this uh, civilian relationship. And I think that it will take time to do, but I think that we're going in the right direction and it, it has already um, uh, showed uh, some successes. I think it's in part, uh, given our, our um, many high-level uh, principal visits, Ambassador Holbrook has been there, uh, I think, eight times in the past year, is headed there again at the end of the month. Admiral Mullen has been there a number of times, the Secretary, obviously, uh, President Obama referencing it. Um, obviously the interest of, uh, of Congress and, and Kerry Luger Berman, but as well as the, um, the ongoing uh, st uh, strategic dialogue, which uh, Secretary Clinton is hosting here uh, next week with, uh, with Foreign Minister Qureshi uh, leading the, uh, the Pakistani delegation and, and uh, trying to demonstrate the, the, the breadth and depth of, uh, of the issues that we have to discuss rather than seeing it through, through the very narrow uh, military security uh, prism. Um, so, in terms of how we will, uh, how we are seeking to use the Kerry Luger Berman money, it's um, it's to do exactly what you've what you've said in some part. It's to it's to have impact, to use the money obviously efficiently and to build sustainability. But as we've laid out in our regional stabilization strategy and others, we've also highlighted these uh, high visibility, high impact projects in five or six different key areas, which is meant uh, to demonstrate. Uh, what America's commitment is over the long term in energy, uh, as the Secretary announced on her visit uh, with $125 million towards efficiency mechanisms that put uh, many more watts on the, uh, on the grid, uh, but also in water and agriculture and health and education and governance. And we're in the process of developing those right now as we're also continuing the work that we've done uh, in, in, in development in the country uh, over, over the years. So um, we're very cognizant of, uh, of, of that relationship, of the perception of the Pakistani people and of trying to change that. And, uh, uh, and we are there for, for, for the long term, and, uh, and we think that over time, uh, as that uh, becomes evident, uh, that, uh, that those perceptions will change. If, if I may just add to that briefly, Chairman, um, I would just say what's, what will be important to the Pakistani people, in my own experience, is that long-term commitment. And that's why I think the enhancing pa partnership uh, with Pakistan is so, me, so and important. And you don't want to react to my question as to how much of an impact the drone attacks have either? I cannot comment on that, sir. Uh, I just know that uh, what we're talking about here do not lend themselves to droneable solutions. No, and, and Mr. Chairman, I know my time's up. And I, and some, I some time now, yes. No, and I, uh, and I appreciate it. I think mine might have been 30 seconds, but the, uh, the point being, uh, a perusal of Pakistani newspapers, despite all your best efforts, seem to show that the drone attacks and, and, and again, whether or not we think it's rational, the trial of the female doctor uh, are just blowing away all your efforts as it gets to the hearts and minds of the Pakistani people. You know, I, I would just comment on one thing on that is, you know, if you read the Pakistani papers about the uh, Kerry Luga Berman thing, you've got an entirely different impression from what reality was on the ground, too. So I think Which is frustrating. It is frustrating. It's hard to tell really what's going on, whether it's manipulation or accurate reporting on that. Mr. Lutkemeyer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
In some of the information we have here, there's a, um, a quote from June 29th of the New York Review, something to the effect that says, rather we, rather we can expect a slow, insidious, long-burning fuse of fear, terror, and paralysis that the Taliban have lit and the state is unstable and partly unwilling to douse. Um, with the recent arrests that have come about in Pakistan and their seemingly different approach to dealing with the Taliban, do you see an improvement in the uh, government's ability to control its own destiny here, or is it still as unstable or more unstable than what the original um, comment was made almost a year ago? Uh, we're certainly happy to offer any sort of briefings uh, to you or, or, or others about uh, about the arrests and, and include the intel component, which I can't really speak to. Um, I think that uh, there are a number of indicators that our uh, relationship with the government of Pakistan is on increasingly uh, stable and, and more constructive grounds, and uh, and due to uh, due to actions on on both sides, and uh, it's one that. Uh, both we and the Pakistani government have uh, invested a lot of time and effort into over the past 14 months, and I think that is beginning to uh, show dividends. Mr. Beaver, what's your thought? I, w I would just add that uh, I think what we've seen over the last year and a half is uh, uh, a more conscious effort by the government of Pakistan when it does have to take certain uh, military actions in populated areas that they, they've learned some lessons from the uh, the, the approach they took in the Malakand and Swat and, and Mangora areas and as they've moved into Waziristan with better civ joint civilian planning for better pre-staging of supplies for uh, populations that escape from those areas because of the fighting and for better pre-planning to go back in to try to re-establish stability in, the, in, that, in those areas. To me, that's a signal of uh, better consciousness both within the military of the Pakistan government and the civilian sides of the importance of doing these kinds of stabilization efforts for their security in a more uh, uh, humane uh, way and for more rapid uh, recovery. Well, it seemed that the more stable the government, the better, uh, the more effective our aid would be to the people of Pakistan. I, I would assume that we will be supporting them in those endeavors and hope that they will be able to do a better job of controlling their country and, and their the various factions in there, otherwise the aid's going to fall in the wrong hands, I would assume. Uh, do you have any way to measure how our aid is, how our aid is being effective, how, how effective it is, you know, the number of schools or water projects or more kids being educated or more, kid, or more people uh, having less disease? I mean, do you have some measurable way of, of, of seeing what we've been doing, how, how the, what the outcomes are? Yeah, in those areas where we operate, we do uh, baseline surveys, we do monitoring, we do uh, interim assessments as well to see how many more children are, are able in the certain catchment basin, let's say, of population able to get some minimal uh, primary education, for example. How many more girls are coming back into school because we've combined a food program, feeding program like our Head Start, for example, uh, uh, so that in fact they are in fact uh, more motivated to come into school. Um, we do monitor maternal child health statistics and maternal morbidity and infant mortality. Uh, so those are the kinds of measures we try to take as we operate how many, uh, what kind of community development activities, how much community participation we're getting, including uh, female participation in the communities, especially difficult in areas of FATA, for example. Uh, we do have ways to do that, and if you would like more information, we can make that available to the committee. I would also add that the, uh, the White House has undertaken their metrics uh, process, um, uh, which has been ongoing over the, the past six or eight months. And I, I know that the first uh, report due to Congress, I, I believe, will come at the end of this month. Um, regarding FATA in particular, just to amplify what, what Jim said, I think there is a sense that um, uh, because of the security issues, because of uh, other ongoing concerns, that there's not necessarily much that we've been able to do there. And uh, that's very much not the case. Just uh, since September 2009, USAID and OTI have completed 32 activities totaling over $1.6 million. These have included repaving seven roads, 15 water supply and sanitation activities, four flood protection walls, three electricity system rehabilitations. Okay, okay. very good. That, that, was my, that was my question before my time runs out. I got one more question. I thank sure. you. I didn't want to interrupt you here, but I do have one more question I want to get to real quickly. I know in Afghanistan we are using 
uh, the National Guard uh, operation where we have uh, National Guard individuals who have a background in agriculture to come in and help train and work with the Afghanis to try and, and teach them some different farming methods as well as help establish new markets for their farming uh, products. Is there something like that that is being thought of as a way to uh, implement in, the, uh, in, in Pakistan as a way to gain the trust of the uh, Pakistani people, the various factions there, because I know that, that seems to be what's working in Afghanistan, and it's a great way to turn the people uh, to to realize that we're there to help, not to harm. Is there anything like that uh, under consideration, or is that strictly something that's uh, only going uh, in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate your indulgence. At this time, no, although I, I must say we, we are extremely grateful to the U.S. National, to the, Army, the National Guard, from I think nine states now in Afghanistan that are operating there uh, on agriculture development teams together with U.S. Department of Agriculture and our own uh, AID advisors. Uh, at this time, as to the best of my knowledge, we're not planning or thinking of that uh, on the Pakistan side. We have other ways to deliver agriculture-related assistance together with USDA, by the way. Well, you, the reason for the question was you made the comment about building relationships with the people we have to earn their trust, and it seems to be working in Afghanistan. I was seeing as if that would be something you'd be thinking about is trying to way to earn the trust of the people of Pakistan as well. Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate your indulgence. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your comments. Thanks for your questions. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your uh, testimony uh, here today. I, I want to get back to this question that we've been tossing around about metrics. Um, and as compelling as data is about the number of roads paved and the number of children educated, um, it, it strikes me that that's ultimately not why we're there. If, if just investments in social uh, infrastructure and in hard infrastructure were our end product here, then we should be in a lot of places in the world. The, the, the metric here ultimately is, uh, to Mr. Quigley's point, is whether or not we are creating the conditions upon which people will feel better about the United States and feel less um, inclined to uh, move into an extremist movement there that threatens both the stability of the country and threatens the United States. Uh, and so I guess my question is, how, how do, do, do you think about how we measure that? And what are the ways in which we can do it? I think I agree. It's hard to do that on a national basis um, because we've got a lot of other competing factors that are hard to measure for. But I wonder if there are ways to do that on a localized basis in areas of the country that we have heavy investments in and where we are paving roads and putting kids to school and setting up health clinics. Is there a way to measure what the, um, uh, what the sentiment there is to the United States and what the local activity of extremist groups are in those uh, in those areas. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about how we measure what is our ultimate objective uh, rather than our intermediary objective of making the investments and making them stick. Uh, on, the, on the more macro picture, the, the combating extremism is, is obviously a, a core reason, if not the core reason, for um, uh, for part of our assistance programs as laid out again in our in our regional stabilization strategy um, and in fact the 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 kind of central uh, focus of the president's speech on Afghanistan and Pakistan on on December 1st um, so clearly how successful we are in ultimately combating uh, extremism is um, is 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 critical to this um, the metrics in terms of actually gauging and evaluating that are, are obviously a lot more difficult. I mean, it is something that's part of every conversation. There are uh, more specific aspects um, that we uh, attempt to use in combating extremism. The the new um, public diplomacy and, and uh, counter-propaganda programs that we've had and trying to get out uh, more moderate voices more frequently. Um, but in terms of actually uh, how we gauge uh, the moderating impact um, or uh, even you know whether we'll have access to that information and, and certainly not yet I think at this point it's a far longer term process is one that you know we're continuing to, to evaluate how we how we best capture that information in the in the relative short term the 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 outputs are are, are the easiest gauge um, but clearly they don't tell the whole story as well and we have to say not only how many schools are built but how they're then used and what the sustainability is and ultimately what the literacy rate in that region is and so it's it's a 
constant process of adjusting that as we get the information and over the course of time. Um, but um, but with the, the the ultimate goal, the the combating uh, extremism is is is, is certainly um, a core piece of that. Uh, more very good questions. <laughs> I would just add that. Uh, um, in the end, uh, one of the metrics I kind of keep in my mind is the continuity and the strength of the civilian government and the existence of the civilian gov civilian led government in Pakistan. It's an indicator to me of uh, their satisfaction with a civilian elected and a civilian led government because of the uh, as you know the the rotations over time of civilian government versus military government. Um, and uh, strengthening that relationship between the people, as I said earlier, the governed and the governing, is extremely important. And I think we'll see indicators of that in the coming months in Pakistan, because they are now going through, in each province, decisions by each provincial assembly as to how they will hold their own local elections, their equivalent of district or Nas, used to be called Nazim elections. That, I think, will be, you asked at the local level, an indicator of what are the people thinking about the way that Pakistan government is moving forward in servicing its people. And it will be a mixed story. I am absolutely sure it will be a mixed, a mixed message. To me, rule of law is extremely important in how they perceive rule of law at the local level, how they perceive corruption by local officials or not at the local level, and how they perceive delivery of services and their demand for those services at the local level. I, I understand how difficult this is, and I understand even when you're talking about local measurements like election results, it's very difficult to extrapolate that simply to USAID versus a lot of other factors. But to the extent, uh, Mr. Feldman, you were talking about the White House's new effort to try to implement metric strategies, I think to the extent that we can, that we can try to get at our end goal and in some way measure that back to where we have made investments and where we haven't, it makes it a lot more helpful for, for those of us who right now are operating on faith and, and, and who believe this is the right strategy to go back and translate that to our constituents back home that are sometimes skeptical of us spending this amount of money abroad instead of here at home. So I, I'd encourage you to continue to think about how to uh, best measure that. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Lynch, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank both of our witnesses for your, your help with the committee's work. Uh, we were Okay. Uh, we were in uh, Pakistan several weeks ago uh, meeting with some of the uh, USAID and, and some of our NGOs there. And there was some concern raised about uh, the, well, the focus is right, I think, in terms of uh, the federally administered uh, tribal areas in the Northwest uh, uh, Province. However, uh, there was some, some concern about the safety of uh, of NGO, NGO personnel uh, in some of those regions. And there was a uh, sort of a, uh, a reassessment going on, I, I guess you could call it, where um, Western employees were sort of hunkering down in areas uh, closer into Islamabad and trying to get services out uh, to the population in those areas through Pakistani nationals. And it was a sort of a, uh, they, they were changing it on the fly and there were, there were even, uh, you know, uh, sustained concerns about the safety of those uh, Pakistani nationals doing work on, on our behalf or on behalf of the, uh, the Pakistani people. And I, I was just trying to get a sense of uh, how how much is that affecting the efficacy of our our attempts here to to bring capacity to those uh, those governments in in the tribal areas in the northwest frontier province? Uh, I appreciate your question, Congressman Lynch. Um, it's one on our minds all the time. It's our preeminent concern, frankly. Um, uh, 
and we have uh, in in both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan we've lost a lot of a lot of our uh, a lot of people paid under our assistance programs, uh, more, of course, in Afghanistan than in Pakistan. Um, and uh, uh, the local nationals, in this case Pakistanis, are the ones who are most exposed. Uh, we, we, we know uh, I mean, the head of CHF was uh, murdered in Peshawar a year ago, along with his, uh, one of his uh, Pakistani staff. Uh, there have been kidnappings of uh, staff from our NGOs. So Sir, could I ask you to just speak up a little bit? I'm an old iron sure, worker, sure, sure. and I, I have bad what, hearing. What oh, we've sorry. what we've tried to do now, and since the time you were there, is whenever any of our partners come to us, and it's usually at their initiative to say, will we uh, provide funding to them so they can adjust their agreements, their contract or their grant or their cooperative agreement, as we call it, to allow some expenses to improve their security. Uh, we look at that very seriously and make sure in consultation with our security office, regional diplomatic security people at the embassy, that we come to a mutually agreeable accommodation so that in fact they can try to improve their security. We also count, have to count on, uh, the, uh, on the Pakistani uh, uh, security services themselves to assist us with the right kind of information about areas where these people work and where they have to go into uh, and come back and commute back and forth. So we, we have done that kind of coordination since the time that you were there and raised some of these concerns and were responsive to them. So it has not stopped us from being able to operate and to be able to support Fatah Secretariat and others, for example, or even in the Northwest Frontier. But uh, it is certainly something that constrains us uh, on any given day. Okay. All right. I'm just about out of time. Uh, actually, Mr. Fellman, would you like to add to that, please? I, I completely agree with, with what Jim said. I mean, it's a constant calibration between obviously having to be mindful of the security situation and, and wanting to um, protect lives while also trying to do the critical assistance work that, uh, that we continue to do in, in those areas. Um, I would give as a, as a recent example, um, the U.S. Uh, has agreed to provide $55 million for reconstruction projects in South Wazaristan focused on roads, dams, rehabilitation, and power grid. And General Zubair has, has uh, worked very closely with, uh, with Ambassador Rafal and our embassy in Islamabad um, to, to, to um, ensure that access for U.S.-funded Pakistani monitors would be one of their top priorities. And so as we continue to try to push forward, and there's a, a range of other uh, oversight mechanisms we've tried to put in place in that, which I'm happy to talk about uh, later, fixed reimbursement agreements and things like this. But, um, but we have tried to uh, you know, work with and mitigate to the extent we, we can the security situation um, while still, uh, you know, while, while still being very cautious about, uh, uh, about risking lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Van Hollen, you recognize five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both uh, for your uh, service. And I want to commend you and the whole team on what I think has been significant progress uh, over the last uh, year or so uh, in Pakistan. And I think we're beginning to see the results, at least with respect to re responsiveness and engagement of the government of Pakistan. Uh, in fighting the most extreme elements. It wasn't long ago uh, that President Musharraf was entering into non-aggression pacts with the Pakistani Taliban in Swat Valley, uh, largely as a result of the change in government and the engagement uh, of the new administration, a diplomatic, political, economic offensive. Uh, you have a much greater degree of cooperation engagement. Not only has the military gone after the Pakistani Taliban, uh, but they've also taken very important steps in going after elements of the Afghan uh, Taliban uh, based in uh, Pakistan. We saw that, obviously, with the arrest of uh, Mullah Omar's uh, operational head and the arrest of the uh, shadow governors uh, and other signs of greater cooperation. And, and that is a result, I believe, of greater confidence and cooperation between the U.S. government and the Pakistani government and a view on the Pakistani side that they have a big stake as well uh, in defeating extremism, whether it's the Pakistan Taliban or ultimately trying to resolve the situation with the Afghan uh, Taliban. So I think that uh, that is important uh, progress, and I think it's the result, in part, of engagement at all levels, including economic engagement, and sending the signal that we are there uh, for the longer term. 
Uh, and I uh, commend you on the idea of trying to channel more resources through Pakistani contractors and indigenous institutions, uh, with the caveat, of course, and you've raised this, that we have to make sure there's transparency and accountability. As we, as we put more funds through local organizations and build capacity, we need to make sure that those monies are being well spent. Now, on the other side, so there's building this relationship with the government, but we're all frustrated with the fact that if you take a poll in Pakistan today, among the Pakistani people, the United States is held in very low regard. And as the chairman pointed out, you know, what was a very good thing, the Kerry Luger uh, Berman legislation aid, uh, we, you know, it was like kicking the gift horse in the mouth. Uh, although we don't see it as a gift, we see it as part of our engagement and interest. At the same time, it was something that was a good thing. Uh, so while I like the idea of channeling more funds and building capacity, at the same time, those American taxpayer dollars are not necessarily, we, we don't get the, the, the credit necessarily uh, for those investments in the mind of the Pakistani people. And I think there's a real feeling that while we pumped millions and millions of dollars into important things like institution building and democratic building, that if you were to turn around and ask the average Pakistani citizen, you know, what is the, what has the United States done in terms of economic development? It's, it's hard for them to identify something. So uh, my question is, in addition to doing these kind of things, should we not also think of doing some of the things we used to do in the past, USID used to do much bigger investments that were important investments in the country, uh, but at the same time drew the national attention of the Pakistani people, clearly identified as a something, an investment being made by the United States in the future of Pakistan and the future relationship, because there is a concern that after spending all this money, especially as you channel it more through the government of Pakistan, which builds capacity, that n no one in Pakistan among the Pakistani population can say, well, yeah, the United States helped us in this particular concrete way. If you could respond to that and what, what uh, ideas you have with respect to some of these other projects. Uh, Congressman, I, I, we certainly... Uh agree with your comments. Uh, it's important that the Pakistani people have some visibility and see uh, the benefits of cooperation with the American people and the American Assistance Program with uh, our people's money. Um, uh, so we are looking and have already initiated the first wave in the last few months of assistance to the energy sector, uh, trying to rehabilitate and repair some of their existing power systems. They will see that to the extent they see things quickly in the press, they should also see it in terms of the effects in certain parts of the country on their load shedding. Now again, these are the, just the first steps. It's a country of 175 million people, plus or minus. Uh, it's more than half the population of our country. So when you take that, even with a very generous assistance program we have now, it's still less than eight or nine dollars per capita in the country. So we have to do this extremely catalytically. And we have to be very thoughtful on how we approach this. So we'll be working in energy, which all Pakistanis can immediately identify with as a need. We'll be working in water, which is an extremely important feature for the Pakistanis, both in agriculture, in quality of water, potable water in their communities, but also in water distribution systems. And obviously because of Indus Basin Treaty concerns that are also political concerns in the country. Uh, so th those are just some quick examples, but we want to make sure as we do those more infrastructure programs that the policy reforms are there too, so that our people's money uh, is, is put into programs that in fact will uh, be sustainable financially, and uh, uh, that's a, that those are the two examples I'd like to share with you. Thanks, Congressman Van Hollen. I, um, I appreciate your, your stage setting as well because I think it is uh, critical as we think about how we continue to move forward, what the metrics are, recognizing that there's still great, uh, uh, a sense of great skepticism about um, the American relationship among Pakistanis that just a year ago the Taliban were 100 miles from Islamabad. I mean, we were uh, facing a quite critical scenario in that over the course of the past year, uh, through the increased uh, cooperation at every level of, uh, of government, um, we have seen uh, the development of a, of a far more 
uh, cooperative, constructive, uh, civilian-based relationship, which I think is starting to yield uh, real benefits now, but it will take, I think, a significant amount of time to continue to see these benefits as per the earlier questions about how do you actually gauge uh, something like combating extremism. Um, your question on, uh, on, on how we, how these benefits help to accrue to the U.S., how, how, how people help to, uh, how people focus on uh, what the U.S. has contributed to them in our, in our development projects. It's obviously one that the development community uh, grapples with all the time. And as we came to it, um, in terms of looking at how we could best use this Kerry Luger Berman money, we, um, we also went through the exact same calculus. And we really tried to walk the line between continuing to do the institutional capacity building uh, as we've done over time, but also demonstrate, and this is where this, this whole term of either signature projects or high impact, high visibility projects ha has come from, but to do at least uh, one type of those projects in each of the five or six main sectors we've identified that are most important to Pakistanis, starting with energy, given, given the Secretary's trip last fall, and, and, and um, the second one being water, um, showing that we're hearing the concerns uh, of the Pakistani people beyond just the border regions, beyond where we're seen to have a, a more narrow targeted interest. And I think um, the, uh, the, the process that evolved as we considered what we could do in the energy field was a very instructive one. I think we, we started with the idea of let's build something big that we can stand on and have a ribbon cutting and everyone will know that, uh, that, that America built this. And as we looked more and more into it, first of all, uh, the costs were exorbitant, the sustainability issues were, were, were there, um, it was questionable what the needs were. And as we started looking more at the actual needs, uh, it became far more uh, clear that working on the efficiency issues, uh, working on getting more watts on the grid, avoiding some of uh, the blackouts in, in uh, high consumer and commercial areas, um, which we could do relatively quickly and easily through this $125 million uh, tube well project, um, would be far more constructive, um, far more efficient, and, and more sustainable. And, um, and so instead of the kind of signature energy project, a dam or something like that, we have come up with this ener signature energy initiative. And I think that the same process is unfolding in many of the other sectors. Uh, in education, uh, you know, we could have uh, looked at building an American university. Um, but again, how sustainable is that over the long term? What are, what are, what's the commitment there? Um, does that become a target in and of itself? And so I think, uh, although we're still very much in the process of trying to determine which direction we're going and, and post and USA and, and state together are, are actively looking at a number of these projects in the, in the remaining sectors, something like a, a center of excellence at an existing university or some sort of faculty, which would be seen as this is a gift of the American people or in, done in co conjunction cooperation with the American people helps to build that, but is also not necessarily the grand uh, bricks and mortar uh, vision that we had of, of big development projects in the in the 60s and 70s. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank you very much. You know, the dilemma I think all of us uh, have is number one. Uh, what's the basic purpose of the aid? Uh, and uh, it has to be tied, obviously, to national security, however uh, else we describe it. Uh, and number two, uh, in order to deliver that aid, how can it be effective? How can we get our money's worth? And the models that we've used, uh, whether it was depending on international contractors and NGOs where there's a high overhead, uh, whether it's dependent on Pakistani min ministries where there's a high level of corruption, uh, and whether it's dependent on NGOs where uh, there's huge oversight problems. The only way we can be successful, uh, and I'll, I'll just ask you this, is whether we have, Mr. Be Beaver, a, a, an honest and uh, a competent uh, Pakistani partner. I mean, would you agree with that? Absolutely. So if we don't, I mean, there's disputes between the military and uh, uh, the civilian government, uh, there's a weak civilian government that's up and down. Uh, other than for purposes of domestic consumption and the need that uh, uh, we have to at least appear that we're attempting 
uh, to win hearts and minds through development projects, through economic opportunity projects, through education projects. If we are honest with ourselves and ask the hard question, can we realistically be successful when the implementation ex and execution really requires an honest partner in Pakistan? Well, uh, this is one of the purposes of our financial pre-award assessments. Uh, it's our procurement officers, it's our controllers, it's our project officers also that check out these organizations before we well, see, provide this is my assistance point. to I them. Mean, I, 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 or, it's a real dilemma. I don't mean to be challenging because yeah, I know you're yeah, doing your level yeah. best. And it, obviously it's desirable for us to be doing uh, projects that are going to improve the, li the lives of uh, Pakistani people. But there is a hard question that we have to ask. We can have all the auditors in the world. We can have all of the honest NGOs in the world. Uh, but if there's not a mechanism that is, uh, uh, that is solid uh, in Pakistan, uh, we're going to have uh, Iraq all over again. I mean, that's, a, that's the hard question. And, and what you seem to be acknowledging is that we really do need an honest partner there. Uh, Mr. Feldman, how about you? Of course, I, I absolutely agree that we need an honest partner. We're doing everything that we can to to work with the honest partners, to identify those, to vet them, and to and to, no, and, and to make sure. And to, politeness requires that we say kind things, but the mechanisms over there uh, don't exist. It, it's it's our need now because we have an urgent national security need. Uh, things have changed, uh, apparently somewhat for the better, as Mr. Van Hollen has mentioned. But I think most of us would probably come to the conclusion that it had much more to do uh, with a self-interested conclusion made by the Pakistani military uh, that the, uh, the Afghan Taliban, or the, pardon me, the Pakistani Taliban were starting to cause trouble that made their lives difficult. It was not a result of uh, the, 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 the Kerry Luger aid. I mean, would you agree with that? Uh, I think it's a combination of factors. I, I think that it's an evolving, changing relationship that's dependent on many things, and I think that the Kerry Lieber uh, yeah. aid will be quite critical for that. Well, I see, think when, when I was there, I mean, I just I was there uh, uh, with the chairman, and what was really apparent when you're there is how incredibly difficult it is to actually get a water project, an education project, you name it, how hard it is to actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk here, and we can talk about metrics, but. It, it, there's an abstract quality to it because the people on the ground, the security challenges they face, the lack of infrastructure, uh, administrative infrastructure to make it happen, these are enormous impediments to the best intention, the best and hardest working people. Uh, and, you know, for domestic reasons here, we have to act beyond military. Uh, but on the other hand, with all of the practical problems, I wonder whether it doesn't make sense to do a big visible project uh, somewhat like the, 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 the approach described by Mr. Van Hollen. It's easier to control uh, the, the, the money, uh, more confidence that you'll get uh, a dollar's worth of, uh, well, maybe 70 cents worth of uh, work for a dollar's worth of income. Uh, and it is a substantial and visible project. Uh, I mean, maybe I just, I know my time's up, ask each of you to briefly comment on that. Uh, I, I would just comment that in my experience uh, with Pakistan over a quarter of a century and half my career, there are leaders in Pakistan, there are reformers in Pakistan, right. there are many right. Pakistanis of very high integrity, such high integrity that sometimes in past governments they could not be trusted and they were sidelined and some of them are back uh, and there are there is a growing I think appreciation by the Pakistani business community and Pakistani civil society that they have to take more charge uh, uh, at their levels for the future of their country and to hold their leaders uh, as accountable as we hold our leaders accountable and I think that's a very important phenomenon that's evolving in Pakistan today and obviously the extremist threats to the country's future helped to mobilize that whether it was attacks on universities or police stations in Lahore 
regardless of those things that were going on in the FATA and the NWFP. And I think the real future of that country and our assistance to it is linked to our ability to support those who have the courage inside their own society to transform their own society. And that's where we will be most effective. And over the long run, getting to Congressman Van Hollen's question also, that's where the Pakistani people will thank the American people the most, but it'll take time. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Drehos, you recognize the five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for, for being here today. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on Mr. Van Hollen's comments about Pakistani perception of USAID in Pakistan. I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer, uh, and I'm curious as to how we are engaging in soft diplomacy. Uh, there are many projects, uh, massive projects, uh, littered around developing countries uh, that were done counter uh, to the will uh, of the people in certain countries that, uh, because of one reason or another, uh, were, were failures and they stand out as failures of USAID policy um, in those countries. Yet we know that a soft diplomacy often works very effectively in, in terms of changing opinion uh, toward the United States um, of you know, folks that are, you know, obviously uh, living in those countries. So I was wondering just if you could start off by telling me what we're doing to engage in soft diplomacy in Pakistan. I guess, uh, Congressman, first of all, I would say uh, it will depend in part how we define soft diplomacy. But uh, in terms of if it also includes um, democracy and governance-related activities, uh, whether it's um, just person-to-person uh, -person, uh, contacts, which is going to be uh, part of the, one of the key areas for the uh, strategic dialogue uh, next week and continuing to build those um, ties with, uh, with NGOs, obviously continuing to build ties uh, with both uh, uh, federal um, and uh, and provincial leaders, uh, parliamentarians, and uh, and other elected leaders. The democracy and governance program, and, and Jim can uh, give more details, has um, a parliamentary strengthening um, uh, dimension to it, a local governance dimension to it, um, an elections-based dimension to it. I know that uh, NDI and IRI and, and other organizations are very interested in continuing to do more. There's a whole range of, on, on the softer diplomacy, there's a whole range of kind of communications mechanisms. Our new undersecretary of public diplomacy, Judith McHale, has uh, put together a, a very robust uh, communications uh, uh, strategy, which has already started putting out bids for uh, children's educational TV programs uh, uh, in, in local languages, um, uh, uh, other communications uh, uh, programming, radio, television, using uh, new social media networks, cell phones, and, and other things. So there's there are a, a range of activities uh, that are that are currently in the works and, and starting to be implemented. Um, but um, but I'm happy to to come back and. Well, and I, I guess I'm I'm concerned that those all seem to be up here. And and what are we doing at the ground level in in the villages, you know, in the cities, in terms of touching people, you know, face to face, in terms of uh, American uh, Americans uh, on the ground. Um, and, and engaging in some type of cultural exchange in addition to development. And because, you know, the, when we talk about democratization, when we talk about, you know, federal government intervention with the Pakistani government, uh, that's a bit different than being at the village level uh, and on the ground. Yeah, I, if I could just add, Congressman, uh, one, of the, one of the evolutions you will see this year in our program, security permitting, will be deepening our, our, our depth, uh, deepening our presence in the country. We will be moving out of just Islamabad, I'm talking about AID, and establishing regional offices in Lahore to service the people of Punjab, in, in uh, Karachi to service the people of the Sindh and uh, Baluchistan, uh, in addition to a very modest presence in Peshawar, which is constrained right now for American officers by security. Um, and that will enable American officers again, I'm talking AID, and sadly we don't have a Peace Corps presence there, um, to be able to get out with the people more, with the business community, with the local associations, with women's groups, with communities, with the governors and the district uh, officials, uh, the kinds of things we used to be able to do 25 years ago when I first served there, and that we've all been wanting to do. And that's why we'll be basically tripling over time, over the next two fiscal years, funds, assuming funds are available, our American officer presence. But we're also going to be uh, more than doubling our Foreign Service National Pakistani staff to also serve in Lahore and in Karachi 
and be able to help us get out more as well. With, with regard to the AID assistance delivery and the transference to local NGOs, what lessons have we learned in terms of accountability and sustainability um, in terms of Pakistani NGOs and, and how they're able to uh, engage in, in development and uh, do we have outcomes measurements that we're using uh, to hold them accountable similar to what we would be doing uh, with international NGOs and American NGOs operating with USAID contracts? A number of questions in in your uh, larger question there. It's a uh, clever tactic that Mr. Drejos uses to <laughs> eat up his 30, 30 seconds that were remaining. But please go ahead and respond. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, we do have to assess the capability of these groups. We have to make sure they're actually registered with their own government, um, that uh, our financial analysis and those of our uh, Pakistani firms that we use assure that, in fact, they're following their own law first to make sure they're accountable. Uh, we, we also have learned some lessons about how we do our grants, because you're talking NGOs, they're usually grants. So we don't necessarily always give it all in one big amount of money up front. We tend to give an initial amount, see how they do, give an incremental amount, see how they do, and then give a final amount. Those kinds of things to meter the flow of money to make sure we get the performance that they told us they want to do, and we are assisting them in what they claim they are good at. That's why we provide grants or cooperative agreements. In the case of cooperative agreements, we have a clause that's called substantial involvement. It means U.S. government has a much deeper relationship with the grantee than under a normal grant arrangement, and we exercise that through our assistance officers that are, have federal warrants. Uh, so those are just some examples. In terms of measurement, every one of our program activities has to have uh, a, 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 a measurement and monitoring plan, and then we make that available to the Inspector General to hold us accountable in the way we do our business as well. Those are some of the lessons we've learned over time, Congressman. May, may I just add w one thing to it? I mean, one thing which I think you're very right to focus on is the impact on the ground, but uh, in an example like, like SWAT, just in, since September, um, the the combination of the work of the Pakistani government in helping to uh, return uh, IDPs, but also the U.S. aid work, um, uh, has really contributed to a resumption of normalcy there, which I think would have been unimaginable uh, six months ago. So helping um, to build, to uh, rebuild uh, government Pakistan offices, um, helping to rebuild schools, helping to do and and thereby enabling people to return and, and resume that degree of stability, I think, has been uh, very significant from both a uh, national security strategic uh, sense as well as what our overall development goals are. If, if I could just add, we also vet our partners. Uh, we are required to check to make sure that the partners that we provide assistance to are not on a certain terrorist lists. We make sure that our partner organizations are in good stead with their own government from a financial perspective and their own, whether they pay taxes or whether whatever their particular rules are. And we're particularly mindful of what was called the Negra Ponte uh, uh, guidance from the last administration, which basically asked us to assess the risk in each of our partners and to adjust our controls depending upon the risk we assess with that particular partner in that particular geographic area from the point of view of the money going to hands that it, to whom it should not go. Thank you very much. Ms. Chu, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, well, last week, a uh, militant stormed the uh, northern uh, Pakistani offices of the World Vision and uh, killed six workers, uh, injuring five. Uh, it is the world's largest uh, Christian charity and works in, in some of the poorest and most politically unstable places on earth and also educates and employs local women. Uh, all these factors make it a target uh, for uh, extremists. So there, um, what my question is, uh, concerning this situation, what implications does this have for um, Pakistani NGOs that, that receive aid, and, and what about their safety and security? Uh. Certainly, we, we condemn the actions on uh, World Vision, and we're very, very uh, sorry and troubled to have seen that incident. But it's 
uh, unfortunately, um, not uncommon for NGOs and, and others doing this type of work to be to be targeted. Um, we have uh, we are continuing to work as as you know we discussed here today. Uh, within the constraints that we have to walk that fine line between um, continuing uh, the, the very important assistance work, the work focused on, uh, on women's issues and some of the other things that, that World Vision was doing um, in uh, the neediest areas with the security concerns. And so uh, I know Jim can talk a little bit more about um, the kind of security mechanisms that we uh, try to put in place or try to work through uh, in the most conflict-ridden areas. Um, but it's it's a um, as I've as I've said it's a constant calibration that Post uh, tries to work through in terms of uh, where we will continue to to uh, target our work, to target our resources, to try to continue the assistance work with, while also being as as cognizant uh, about the real risks uh, that people are facing and trying not to put them directly into harm's way. I, I would just add uh, uh, that. Wherever, in this case, World Vision, they were not a direct uh, recipient of, of, of USAID. But where they are, we have urged our partners to come to us and say, if you perceive security risks, please describe them to us. Tell us what you feel you need for your people while they're traveling, if it's the, the kind of vehicles they travel in, if it's the protection around where their offices are. Those are things we can help with financially as part of a grant or cooperate agreement or contract. And we've had a lot of experience in this, but they do have to take some initiative to come to us if they perceive problems. But we're not being just passive that way. We've also reached out to them. I met with every chief of party uh, that, that of every contractor, grantee, and implementing partner in Pakistan when I was there uh, in uh, the fall. Uh, and I will be going out again soon. I will meet with them again. And one of the things we did talk about was security. Again, these were ones we support. because uh, So the, they, however, are in close touch with others who we don't support. And they share information. And we've told them anyone who particularly is US registered are welcome to come to, I think it's now a monthly briefing, uh, with the diplomatic security officers. And USAID has our own security officers at the post in Islamabad, where they share information they hear about those concerns, they get advice, uh, and, uh, and there are ways to sort of establish best practices because their own network is faster and better even than ours, frankly. And there are other techniques that could be used, but this is not the appropriate forum uh, to discuss that. But we could discuss it offline if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, that I know that um, Many of the attacks have targeted local Muslim women who were involved with American aid organizations. Uh, is there a way to uh, balance the safety of these women involved in these programs without uh, compromising our, our goal of advancing the rights of women and girls in Pakistan? Um, well, obviously we encourage you know, uh, women's groups or women to participate in all the programs of our assistance. Um, it's first and foremost the responsibility of Pakistani security entities to protect their citizens. That said, there are some things, for example, in schooling and education that we have learned that if schools need walls built around them to protect the children, including the girls, that that is a very legitimate thing for us to do with the American people's money since we want the education to happen and we want more girls in particular to, to participate in the education system, uh, that that's a simple thing, very simple, that in fact does make a big difference. Another, frankly, is training female teachers. The more that there are female teachers in the country, the more families are willing to allow their daughters to go to school because that they, they feel that uh, the teachers will be more responsive to them and, and less of a p possible personal security ri uh, threat to them. These are things Pakistanis have told us, lessons they've learned that we want to be able to help support. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've finished our first round of questioning. With your indulgence, I'm going to see if the members want a question or two more to, before we fold here today. But uh, I'm going to start that. Mr. Flake is deferred, and, and I appreciate that. But. Um, Mr. Beaver, you, you know we concentrate a lot in this committee on the personnel over there and, and the ramping up of U.S. personnel. Uh, it's, many of us have the impression that we were hollowed out 
over, over a period of time, and now we've got to get our capacity back. So if we're decentralizing, we're going to smaller, predominantly Pakistani contracts that, that need oversight from people in our, uh, in our USAID. What's the recruitment process that we have to get people in, and how's that going? What are, what are our numbers look like? What's the training process that we get them up to the capacity that they can actually supervise and manage other people as opposed to just do certain functions? And I think, lastly, that leads to a question um, that was discussed a little bit beforehand. What, if any, legal authorities does USAID need in order to do that recruitment training and the retention of sufficient numbers of personnel for service in Pakistan? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if one looked at, say, contracts officers or procurement professionals, for example, uh, we now have about a half a dozen in Islamabad. Um, these are U.S. Uh, contracts and agreements officers, not to mention uh, Pakistani. Uh, uh, we expect to expand those procurement officials in country over the coming year, probably doubling them. Uh, we expect to move them out into the local area, into Lahore and Karachi as well, to help to help uh, oversee our projects as we get So you'll have deeper. a total of 12 in the entire country? Uh, uh, it'll be uh, uh, at, uh, approximately 12, as I understand it. So, so and those 12 people will essentially do all of the procurement or, or overseeing all of the procurement? They, they also have Pakistani uh, negotiating Compass. assistants and others that have experience doing this with World Bank or ADB or others from whom we've hired some of these staff to be able to help us, and we bring in. But they want to be able. To, you want those people, the procurement office, to be able to know whether or not the Pakistani staff is uh, performing up to uh, yes. sufficient staff or like yes. that, so they can be yes. fairly knowledgeable. So it's still, you got to. We're get still so building. We are still, still building. building. If that's how many what eventually you're would you like to have? Uh, I would think we want to move up to 16 or 24, something like that, between the American and the Pakistani staff over time. So it basically, by the time we're in our last year of, uh, of this Kerry Luga Berman money, you'll be getting up to what point we want to be. I think we can move much faster. We're trying to do this this year and next fiscal year. All right, so you're going to do a half a dozen more this year, but then maybe double it up in the next year. That's that's what we're tr that's what we ought to be doing. I mean, that's let's just in that it's just in that case. But in terms of project office and others, I think we have to face the reality, and you are aware of this, Mr. Chairman, that. Yeah after seven or eight years of working in these highly risky conflict zones where usually they are officers unaccompanied by their families or spouses. Um, it's taken its toll on the agency and that's why we appreciate the support for the DLI part of the Development Leadership Program. Um, those people do have to be brought in, trained up and, and, then, be, and then assigned to some of these more uh, challenging posts. That will take time. And that's why we're moving to expand the number of mid-career development professionals we're bringing into the Development Leadership Initiative. And we're also now recruiting outside to bring people in under what we call Foreign Service Limited um, Hire, which are Foreign Service officers, but they're limited to five-year appointments at a time. It can be renewed once. So it's a technique we've developed in Afghanistan, and we started in Iraq. I was also the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Iraq for two years. Are they, are they, these people experienced in particular areas that you're going out for these five-year periods? We, we, we look for people who've had conflict zone experience. We've looked for, generally our requirements are pretty stiff. We look for master's degree, if we can, uh, plus uh, eight years experience of which four has to be in conflict zones. When we can't get that, we have then asked for eight years, uh, even more years of work experience. and. Uh, uh, and then we do, of course, personal references on all of them. But, but I guess the other thing uh, I would just want to say here is that in terms of training them, this also takes time, and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do in the conflict setting, which is why we try to find people who've already got some of this experience to bring into the... To the uh, have any success successful. in bringing back former USAID uh, personnel? We have. We've reached out to uh, former senior Foreign Service and regular Foreign Service officers. And with the help of Congress, we have special provisions to bring a limited number of officers back who can be sworn in again and retain their uh, annuity as well. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, certain uh, uh, authorities that would be helpful to us, Congress has been forward-leaning on that. 
uh, we can bring certain personal service contractors on board as well as Foreign Service Limited officers. Uh, I think the time will come, though, when we need to find ways to retain, how to retain these officers in these posts that are both dangerous and they're away from their families. What are the motivations to keep them there a second year uh, or even a third year? For example, can we relocate families closer by in that theater, uh, which is what was done in the Vietnam War, uh, so that both military and civilian officers in fact, uh, would stay longer. Uh, are there other financial incentives that potentially could be provided um, or caps lifted on the pay that they can earn? Uh, uh, these are just a couple of uh, simple examples that we really need to be looking at uh, to retain the officers once they get there. They will be four times more effective in their second year than they are in their first year. Do you have someone in your office that you could delegate uh, to deal with Mr. Flake's staff and our staff here to uh, maybe talk through some of those issues with more detail? Would be happy to, uh, okay. absolutely. Well, and I, uh, the staff director, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Wright, will contact okay. you and, and follow up on that. I'll just add that we have done something uh, unique in AID's history in the last uh, six months, both for Afghanistan and Pakistan, recognizing the challenge to get senior officers of the current Corps to come to post. We have designated all the office director positions, of which there are approximately 10 in both posts, as what we call senior management group officers. And that means the administrator personally approves who goes there. And uh, they have to be what we call FS1, class one officers, at a minimum, or senior foreign service officers to go. So normally those designations are required only for mission directors or deputy mission directors. So we have stepped up to the plate here and stepped up uh, the uh, internal incentives for our officers to serve there. Go ahead and ask your question, Jim. Chairman. Uh, may I just say, in, in addition to that, that um, the number of direct hires, I believe, uh, throughout uh, Pakistan have increased 70 percent uh, from 2008. I think it's gone from 336 to 580, with plans to add another 125 uh, by, the, by 2011. So we also are closely monitoring the staffing situation, trying to get uh, the best people out there as quickly as possible, and uh, would be happy to, to join any sort of briefing on those issues. Thank you. I was just going to ask, how, how many, can you give us a ballpark number on how many you've been able to bring back the foreign, uh, foreign service officers through this program? Uh, I, I'm going to have to give that to you separately, but I can tell you I spend a part of every day calling colleagues who used to work for AID, seeing if we can attract them back. Um, and they are serving in Iraq, they're serving in Afghanistan, they're serving uh, in Pakistan. Uh, for example, our deputy director who's in Peshawar is a uh, rehired uh, senior foreign service officer, uh, one that we are currently attracting trying to uh, bring to Karachi as a, will be a, re, a rehired uh, senior foreign service officer. Uh, we also have looked to other missions to loan their mission directors or their deputies to Pakistan, and we've brought three uh, other mission directors out to Pakistan to help us over the past fall and winter. So we are doing everything we can to bolster the senior level of the mission. Thank you. Does any other member wish to ask an additional question? Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to illuminate uh, the problem we're having in attracting uh, former or, or retired uh, members, uh, federal employees, uh, up until about six months ago, uh, we could not get uh, federal, uh, very highly skilled uh, federal employees to come back to work for the government because they would have to, under the law, they would have to forfeit their annuity. Uh, now, corporate, uh, the corporate world has this right where they, if they have a special problem, they just pull people back in out of retirement, they go to work for them, they, that, that person has no uh, learning curve, they, they know the business as well as anyone, but we in government prevented uh, some of our most skilled foreign service officers to come back into government because we would require them to, to forfeit their, their retirement. Uh, about eight months ago, uh, Senator Cocker and I got together 
Uh, we, we changed that in the defense authorization bill, but only for the last uh, six months have we started uh, to, to reach out to, to uh, former federal uh, employees who, you know, these are highly skilled folks that have 20, 30 years experience, but it's only been the last six months that we've been able to bring folks back. One, one of the things I wanted to raise with you, sir, is, is that I think we only allow them to come back for two to three years, and then, and then that expires. And, and I'm just asking, you're talking about a five-year, uh, these special contracts. Uh, we might have to amend that to five years in order to get them to come back under, under your program. So maybe that's something that we could, we could work together. I happen to chair the subcommittee on federal employees, so maybe that's something we could work on. Uh, we would welcome working with the committee, uh, yourself, sir, and others on this. Uh, I'm not aware of that particular limitation, but if it is there, I'd have to check the legislation again, uh, and we could extend it. That would be helpful. I will just toss one suggestion out. Uh, you know, uh, under our, this is not Pakistan, but it's really Afghanistan related and uh, Iraq related up to a certain point. Um, our, our brave soldiers uh, that serve in wartime, in war theater, uh, are exempt from federal tax during the time that they're there, as I understand it. Also, our grantees and our contracts, our grantees and our, our contractors who are there under our pay are exempt from the first certain amount of their uh, income on, on federal income tax, so they have to pay some on certain benefit kinds of packages. I think it's $75,000 or $90,000. The only, the only Americans in harm's way who do not receive that financial incentive to serve and continue to serve are U.S. government civil servants and foreign service officers right. who are in harm's way in these war theaters. Uh, so uh, I will just toss that out as something to think about whether there is a way for those officers who are in harm's way in the same places where every, all other Americans who are there receive some uh, benefit to, in, in, to, as a representation of the risk they're taking might be able to benefit from this in the future is the kind of thing that I think will help both attract and retain officers in the field. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, we have, especially in Afghanistan uh, and in Iraq, where we have agricultural department employees in there, we got, you know, a lot of civilian employees in there, and uh, they're not being treated nearly the same way uh, in, in benefits or even uh, when, when they get injured. Uh, in, in the war zone. There's a whole different way of, of treating them. Uh, I, I don't know if I, looks like I might have another minute left. Minute uh, what's that? Minute and eight seconds. Minute and eight seconds. Can you just give me a, a real thumbnail on SWAT Valley? Uh, because I know that we're putting a lot of money in there. I had a chance to chat with uh, Ambassador uh, Patterson uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, that's sort of a microcosm of our, of our effort there in Pakistan in terms of pushing the capacity of the government out into some of these tribal areas. Could you just give me a, a thumbnail on that? Uh, well, uh, I, I can give you my own historic perspective. When I lived there, I used to go fishing for trout in Swat Valley. It was that safe, and it was a beautiful tourist area. Um, now, of course, it's a different situation, and I, too, was alarmed, as Dan said earlier in our testimony, at how close uh, the extremist elements were to uh, Islamabad, and that, that resonated throughout the country. Today, we're working very closely with uh, the Pakistan government and the Northwest Frontier government, as well as with General uh, Nadim and First Corps and others, and with Pakistani institutions, Parsa among them, to assist in, in the Northwest Frontier, especially Mangora and uh, SWAT with everything from reconstruction of those facilities that were damaged, but more importantly, building back, actually increasing the presence of the Pakistan civilian government, where they used to have one administrative center that may have been blown up by the Taliban when they left, there will be two or three administrative centers. Where there was one police building, there'll be two or three. Where there was one clinic, there'll be two or three. And those are ways to deepen the uh, the, the governance service delivery and the Pakistan civil service are returning to the area uh, and working. So uh, we've spent uh, quite a few hundred million dollars there, 350 to 400 million dollars in relief efforts and reconstruction. There'll be more to come. Thank you, Thank you for your indulgence, Thank you very Mr. Much. Chairman. Any other member wishing to ask additional questions? 
Uh, there being none, let me leave this last question with you, gentlemen. Is, can you tell us how much of uh, President Bush's $750 million program for Fatah has actually been obligated to spend in that region? I don't have that information off right. the top of it, but we'd be happy to. Could you give us a status report on that, on, on how course. much it's been yeah, spent, how much it's been obligated, and how much remains out there, and why it still remains sure, we'll unspent, and, and what its plans may yeah, be? We'll get, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Thank our witnesses very much for your testimony, both written and oral, and your time, and your staffs as well. Uh, we appreciate it. We look forward to dealing with you in the future, and we'll definitely ask Mr. Alexander, Mr. Wright from the committee staff here to talk with Mr. Beaver about some of those incentives, uh, as well as the tax situation that he brought up. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.